Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, as we come to you on this Sabbath day, we ask that your spirit fill this house and fill our hearts as we praise your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's be seated as we enter a time of praise and worship as we begin with uh, Morning Has Broken.
day with Jesus again in heaven. Let's uh, close out with uh, There is a Happy Land. make sure you want to be here. It is such a wonderful pleasure to be with you this wonderful Sabbath day. Amen? Amen. I want to say welcome from our pastor, Lorenzo King, our elders on our church board, and we want to say welcome to all of our visitors and our members that are here today. Do we have any visitors with us this morning? Any visitors? Any visitors? So we're all family members this morning. Well, I want to say thank you again for being with us. We look forward to a wonderful, blessed service today, and we pray that you have a wonderful Sabbath with us. And amen. Peace be unto you, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. Did you enjoy that warm welcome from Ella Thomas? I did enjoy it. I did enjoy it. But I'd like to say on my behalf, Welcome to the Houston Northwest Seventh-day Adventist Church. May God be with you and bless you as we worship, as we fellowship, as we learn about each other, and as we learn about God. Let us not forget who we are. We are sons and daughters of the great God of heaven. Let us do everything we can to be like him. So this is pastor's time, and as I indicated last week, pastor's time is back. It is also a part of the Black History Month celebration. So I have a few things to say. First, I'd like to say welcome back to Sister Dorset Henry. I'm not seeing her now, but she went to Jamaica to, funera to funeralize her father and she's back. We welcome her back. And to all our brothers and sisters who have not been here for a little while, we welcome you. You might not have heard from us, but we still miss you. And sometimes it takes a little time for the missing part to kick in. But we miss you. We welcome you back. Um, like also to see a very special Happy birthday to Sister Dora. Sister Dora, where are you? Yes. There she is. She went through a period of illness, but God has brought her back, and she's here to celebrate 
our birthday today, we will be celebrating with you. I'd like to also ask you to pray for our sick members. There are several of them. Some we know about, some we do not know about. I want to make mention of Veronica St. Rose. She is related to Brother Scott, and it has not been going well for her. Remember her in your prayer. Amen. Also, Sister Loretta Noel. I do not know Sister Noel, and it's time for me to know her. All right? But she, it's not so bad with her. She's bouncing back. Amen. Remember her in your prayers. Um, brother, brother Ruan, Sister Ruan, and some others, keep them in your prayers. All right, um, I want to point out too that we give God thanks for an upgrade to our AV system. This week, it was done. And you are going to be seeing clearer pictures online. You are going to have a cleaner sound. We thank God for all of that, and we want to say a very big thank you to Brother Barnes and, and Brother Arthur for the work they are doing in that area. I must also, let me see what is happening here. <laughs> yes. Now, if you live near Enchanted Gate Drive, if you live within that area, Please see me right after the service. I need a special word with you. If you live in the Enchanted Gate area, please see me right after the service. I need to talk to you. Um, I just posted the preaching roster on the notice board. You should be seeing a preaching roster for every quarter. You have a right to know. So check the notice board. One is posted. We have been doing that, but we have not been calling the attention of the members to it. So it's posted. Please look at it. Please make suggestions to us as well. Um, I want to ask you to, to focus a little on the pastor's part. This is no self-promotion. This is just a simple message. Whether or not the pastor preaches, the pastor has a little word for you. Oh. Yes, yeah, so Amen. we are putting it, in, putting it online, and I can tell you this. I've been getting several remote calls, people from outside of America and people inside America, outside of Texas, have been reaching out. Amen. We are making an impact. So I want you to go to the pastor's box, read it, and make your comment. Brother Barnes, I think we should put up a place where the pastor can be reached via email, right? And you, you can comment on it. You can even suggest something to write about because writing is not the hard part. The hard part is determining what to write about. Amen. So your input would be very, very helpful. Um, the other thing, we are going to be having our fellowship lunch in the, in the what do you call it again? In, in the foyer. We're having some challenges in the designated fellowship hall, but please join us in that area. We are happy to have Ella James to be our preacher today. I like Amen. to hear this brother preach. Amen. Lift him up. Lift him up in your prayers. Amen. Lift up the preacher Amen. in your prayers. And pray for our church as well. Amen. I'm going to decrease now and invite Sister Jackson to come forward and take us into Black History Month segment. Give her a heart to welcome as she comes. Listen, I, I don't know if you 
understand what is happening. This is a crippled woman you see walking. Mm. Say amen. amen. This is a miracle. Come on, Sister Jackson. Look at her. She's walking. God is good. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Black history is not just a history, it's world history. Black History Month represents black influence around the world. And today we're not only celebrating black astronauts, scientists, inventors, or activists of the past, but also artists within our church. We are celebrating the rise of black business and arts all around the world, but today we will be focusing on Henry Asawa Tanner. So please give your attention to the video on the screen. Thank you. Recognized internationally for his work, he became known primarily for his paintings that depicted biblical themes in their original setting. Tanner was born in Philadelphia in 1850. His father was a teacher and bishop in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. His mother was a former slave who escaped to Philadelphia through the Underground Railroad. Tanner painted important works depicting African American subjects, but two of his most prominent and award-winning paintings were his claimed Daniel in the Lion's Den in 1895, and two years later, his Raising of Lazarus won a medal at the Paris Salon and became part of the collection of the Louvre in Paris. Engage with the Bible in its impact on the arts over the centuries. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. Let us stand for the call to worship. Coming from Psalms 136, 1 through 3. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let us read the affirmation of faith. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that's within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Please remain standing. The church has one foundation, it is Jesus Christ. Oh. 
we sing our prayer song, Spirit of the Living God. Sabbath Church, it is time for prayer. For those of you who would like to come forward, please do so. Otherwise, if you could kneel with us. This is our time, brothers and sisters, our time to petition the Lord above. Our King and our Redeemer, this past week you have heard our cries and answered our call. And all that we have needed, your hand has provided. Lord, we come together today seeking the blessing of your presence and to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness and your mercy towards us. Father, we ask forgiveness where we fall short of what we should be and our neglect of our duty to one another. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Please help us be better and do better. Help us be faithful and obedient servants, dear Lord. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will find us faithful upon your soon return. Father, we asked prayer for all of those who are sick among us, we pray in a very special way, dear Lord, for our brother Hart. And we give thanks that our sister Dora is here again, dear Lord, that she's recovering, Father. Please continue to strengthen her and help her recover. We pray for all of those that you heard spoken at the altar, dear Lord, who are asking prayers for illness, Lord. And also, Father, for those We pray for healing, restoration, and revival for the families of the Northwest Church, dear Lord. We need reviving and we need restoration. Father, we ask that you would show favor to our businesses, our finances, our relationships, oh Lord. We pray in a very special way, Father, for all of those that come through your doors, that they will find you here. Now bless us with your Holy Spirit. Guide us, keep us. And if, O oh Lord, I have missed anyone or something that I should have prayed for, please fail not to grant it for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
May the deacons rise for the tithe and offering. After the prayer, the deacons will collect the morning's offerings. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to participate in the service, dear Lord. Thank you for the wonderful responsibility we have to give back to you what you've entrusted. Allow us to have a cheerful heart, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Today's offering is going to Adventist Television Ministries. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Revelation 14, 6. Today this verse is being fulfilled with television ministries. The Adventist gospel message is flying in the midst of heaven in the airwaves of television. There are seven media ministries under the umbrella of the North American Division. Faith for Today, It Is Written, Breath of Life, Jesus 101, Voice of Prophecy, La Voz de Esperanza, and Life Talk Radio. All of these ministries have television content that is not only reaching the United States and Canada, but the whole earth. The speakers for these ministries are holding evangelistic meetings in North America and around the world with many baptisms and many lives touched by the wonderful messages of hope for these last days. Today's offering is for these media ministries to contribute and to continue the gospel commission to preach the gospel to every inhabitant of the planet. In many cities, it is hard to knock on doors and share a piece of literature because people live in apartment buildings, condominiums, and gated communities. But people are coming to Christ because of TV. We invite you for your generous and your offering and support these ministries which are using television and the internet to go inside homes to preach the Advent message. Amen. Put the money up, guys. Put the money up for the children, please. Any offerings you have for the children, put your money up. Put your money up. Come, children. Come, children. Get your offering, please. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Any others? Any others? We have some in the back. We have some in the front. 
Come, 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 come. We have hands up in the back. Anyone else? We have one in the back. Any more? More? We have one more. They're coming to you, brother. There she is. There she is right there. Praise God. Praise God. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you for your offering. and girls how are we doing this morning okay so today the story we're going to be focusing on pencils pencils okay do we all use pencils at school who all have a pencil at home we have pencils at home what kind of pencils do we have at home Pencils. Art pencils. Big pencils. Okay, so we all have different types of pencils, okay? So, let me show you what we're going to be looking at today. Kalina is going to be my helper. <laughs> so, Kalina is going to hold that up for us. So, hold it like this. When we look at this pencil, what do we see? Go close up. When we look at this pencil, what do we see? It has two sides. Great. Okay. What about these right here? It's colored pencils. Yes. So it's all different colors of pencils. with this one here it has an eraser and it's not sharpened great oh you got some scholars in here and then what do we see different about these pencils right here who i did not acknowledge and i when you enter that they have that the eraser isn't at the top where you're supposed to erase it and the tip is not good right she said it's not good we say they're not sharpened and you don't have no eraser. Okay, so they're all pencils though, right? Right. Uh, but this one is broken. It doesn't have it doesn't have the it doesn't have the eraser. These they're all different colors. And we can color with them, we can write with them. This one has two sides. So different, huh? And then this one is what I really want to talk about. So this one right here is exactly how we buy it from the store. It's exactly how it was made. So we all were made by God image, right? We all were made in God image, but then we grow, we learn things, we become artists, we become doctors, we become nurses because we learned it, right? And so we use our skills, we use our knowledge from what our mom and dad taught us, and we develop that. So these pencils, they are in the original form that they were made. But guess what? They are at full potential to be used. They have erasers. All we need is a sharpener. We may need to get something else to fulfill the purpose of it, right? Just like how we go to school to, and we get an education, right? So that's the message today, that we are all made in God's image, but we are different. Can we agree on that? We are all different. So that's the message today. Colleen is going to read two scriptures for us from the Bible. Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created in him. 
male and female created in them. Okay, and then she's going to read Jeremiah 1, 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, in the belly I, I knew thee, thee. And, and before the camest forth out of the, the womb, womb I, I sanctified, sanctified thee, and I ordained thee, and I ordained thee a prophet, a prophet unto, unto the, the nations. nations. Okay. So today we learned that God created us in His own image, and we are all made differently, right? We are to be happy with how God created us and how we become. You know, we are all little ones right now, but we're going to grow up and we're going to, you know, be like mommy and daddy one day. Or oh, auntie and uncle we may not be like mommy and daddy, right? So, who would like to pray for us today? Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for this. Please help us see not Saturday. Please help us to grow more in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Have a good day. Let's go back, go back to our seats. Happy Sabbath, church. Please stand for the scripture reading. Today, our scripture reading will be found in Acts 15, 36 to 41. I will read the first verse, and then you will read the next until we get to the last verse, which we'll read all together. Then, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. But Paul insisted that they should not wait. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria, Sicilia, strengthening churches. May the God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Happy Sabbath, Church. Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath. I am uh, delighted to be here once again. Thank you for the invitation, Sister Nita. Um, and I hope that this praise and worship song is elevated to the heavens and that you may all may be blessed.
beautiful music selection. Beautiful, beautiful. Every time you play Kevin, I'm just amazed. Every time, every time. Um, how's everyone doing today? Good? Me and Pastor were having a little conversation. It seems a little down in here. Usually when I was back in school, our teachers would make us get up. We'd do a little jumping jacks. Do we have to do that? Do we need to do a little bit of that? Some push-ups or something? No? All right, let's, let's get into the word today. Amen? Amen? Um, before I start, let's uh, just have a quick word of prayer. The only Father, we thank you once again for the Sabbath day. We thank you for allowing us to be here to praise your name. As I preach your word, allow it to be what you meant, it, meant for it to be. And allow it to touch those in your congregation and those watching online. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the title of my sermon today is Building Stronger Bonds. I want to take, go a little bit back on Acts. I know the scripture reading was chapter 15. We're going to go back to chapter 12 real quick, verses 25, and then I'll read through chapter 13 to verse 4. And it says, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they, called, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them went on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Cilicia, and sailed from there to Cyprus. And I'm going to jump back to verse 15, read it again. Sometime, or I'm sorry, chapter 15. Sometime after Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp dis disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. I'd like for everyone to just take a moment and think of their very best friend in the world. A friend that you've either known for since your childhood or even someone you've met a few years ago. But this certain person that comes to mind as your very best friend might exhibit some of these, if not all of these traits. Loyal, they're honest, wise, not a yes man or a yes woman. They're accountable, trustworthy, just to name a few, few of these traits. Now this person isn't just your friend because they gain some sort of benefit from hanging around you. They're not someone that you just hear from every once in a while or I'm talking about a ride or die friend. They know you're good, you're bad, and you're ugly, and, and yet they treat you with respect and love. There is nothing in the world like a true friend because no matter where we are currently in our life, everybody needs somebody at some point. As I've gotten older, I've realized two very important things. If you have a good friend, you really don't need many of them. If you find yourself with one or even two good friends, you should consider yourself blessed. Good friends are hard to come by, so when you have them, hold on to them, cherish them, and never take them for granted. Number two, everybody you meet definitely doesn't fall into the category of friend. Every smiling face, everyone who says they're in your corner, Everybody who seems to be by your side will not always be there if they're not a true friend. 
The scriptures even show us the value of a true friend. Everywhere we read, the word is showing us and detailing to us that God created us to be in positive and fruitful relationships with one another because no one can become their best by themselves. We need guidance, we need reminders, we need those wake up calls sometimes. And we aren't always going to have the foresight or the wherewithal or the energy to always do it for ourselves. God shows us that we truly are better together. From the very beginning in Genesis, the creation story details how when God created Adam, he looked at Adam and, and says, it's not good for man to be alone. Now that wasn't just to say that Adam needed a woman, it was saying that Adam needed companionship. None of us can truly rise to the heights that God is calling us to get to without people assisting and helping us to get there. The word friend is even revealed by God to be a powerful term because when Abraham was shown to be faithful in God's eyes, he referred to him as friend. Even John 15, 13 details how important friends should be in our lives. It reads, greater love has no one than this, than to, than to lay down one's life for his friend. I could go on and on about the various teachings of the Bible about friendship and how God has called us into these ordained relationships that help us to be called to a higher calling. Positive, productive relationships propel us into God's purpose, and God has a way of assigning people to our lives to help us to be everything he wants us to be. But, we, but what we might find interesting is finding out that someone in the Bible who has been detailed to be a holy and godly man, had a hard time valuing friendship. A man that we all have learned from, probably used examples of him from the Bible, he exhibited sometimes these problematic, problematic personalities that made him difficult to get along with. And he had a difficulty appreciating relationships that God had created for him. Now, as I describe this person, I'm sure some of your minds are jumping to someone in the present day. But the person I'm referring to is Paul. The same person who started off as Saul and converted and was converted on his way to Damascus, who wrote a majority of the New Testament, who ultimately became a martyr. That same guy had difficulty valuing friendship. And it's shown to us through his dealings with Barnabas. Now Barnabas, who was named Joseph before, but Barnabas was someone that when he heard the gospel preached by Peter and James, he went all in for Jesus and gave his life to them. In Acts 4, we can read that Barnabas sold a piece of his land that he owned and took that money and gave it to the apostles. That money was then distributed out to those who were in need in support of Jesus' ministry. If that's not going all in for Jesus, well, I don't know what is. Now, as I said, Barnabas wasn't always called Barnabas. His name was Joseph, but the apostles soon called him Barnabas, which literally means son of encouragement. Barnabas was the friend that always had your back. He would be the one who'd constantly remind those that they were more than what they used to be. That all things were made new in Jesus if we just believe in him and follow his will. If God has your back and you have him in your heart, anything is possible. Barnabas was even the person that God tasked with seeking out Paul. As, his, as Paul was going through his conversion and on the road to Damascus, Barnabas had Paul's back. Barnabas witnessed firsthand how the presence of the Lord had changed Paul even when people were questioning it because of Paul's past. Barnabas stood his ground and professed Paul's change of heart. Barnabas trusted God's conversion of Paul so much that when he was tasked to preach in Antioch, he brought Paul with him. For a whole year, Barnabas and Paul, they preached the gospel and taught a number of people about the love of Jesus. Their preaching and friendship was so effective that this was actually the first time the term Christian was used. This was a God-productive relationship. 
This was so much so that in Acts 13, when the church at Antioch was ready to spread the gospel, the Holy Spirit appeared and appointed Barnabas and Paul as the two men who would travel to, to Cyprus to continue the Lord's work. The Holy Spirit had purposefully put them together. Now, I'd like to point something out real quick. There are two types of friends in this world. The ones that we ourselves allow and the ones that God has ordained. There are people that we let in and the ones that God has assigned to us. Now, I don't wanna say that the relationships that we allow aren't good ones, but I do wanna point out that the ones that God assigns are truly special. Now, some of us may ask ourselves, hmm, how do I know which friendship is which? How do I know what friendship is one that I've allowed versus one that God has ordained? Well, one way we can tell is the content or the subjects that keep us together. Barnabas and Paul's relationship was propelled by the fact that they were trying to profess God's love, profess their faith, and the discernment towards the assignment God had placed in their lives. Their bond and partnership helped push the gospel further and become more effective because them walking together only built their own relationship with God even more. We know our friendship is ordained because they help us grow in our walk with the Lord. God ordained relationships aren't held together by two people sharing the same sinful nature. Two people that share the commonality of gossip, lying, cheating, causing destruction, that doesn't sound like an ordained relationship to me. Just because that person makes you feel good from time to time doesn't make it an ordained relationship. Just because you share the same afflictions and hurt doesn't make it an ordained relationship. What keeps an ordained relationship together is the feeling that this person is pushing you in the right direction that God has created you to be. Barnabas and Paul were put together by the Holy Spirit because they both were pushing towards not only allowing themselves to grow in God's word, but wanting others to experience it as well. They went on their first mission trip together. They visited many different places and they preached the word. It wasn't until they arrived back in Antioch and talks about a second trip came about that things began to hit the fan a little bit. Now, Barnabas, when talking with Paul, mentioned that on the second trip, he'd like to bring John Mark again. Now, John Mark was also on that first trip. However, when they reached their first destination, it was as if John Mark decided this long journey wasn't for him and he deserted them. He said, peace out, guys. You ever go on a trip with a group of friends and you know you have that one friend at the very beginning, he says he's down for everything. You set up all the activities, you let everyone know how much it's gonna be, they put their money in. But on that trip, there's that one person that just doesn't wanna comply. Now, they'll say that they're too tired for this and that. They, want, they don't wanna go out anymore. The place that you had first wanted to go to, they wanna go somewhere else. That can just ruin the whole vibe and the excitement for everyone. And when talks about a second trip come about, you better believe that his name or her name is not mentioned anymore. I can just imagine this is how John was. Before the mission trip, he was excited, he was pumped, he was happy to be traveling with Barnabas and Paul, preaching the gospel. But they got to their first location, you know, they do their thing, and John Mark is checking his watch like, man, can we go back to Antioch now? I'm sure Barnabas and Paul were looking at him like, this is only the first stop. We, we, we haven't even begun yet. Now, when John basically abandons them and Barnabas is thinking about bringing him along for the second trip, I'm sure Paul is saying, did you not see what this guy did on the first trip? He couldn't hang. He couldn't even get past the first city. Why would we want to repeat that again? The Bible describes that Paul and Barnabas had an argument, and when they couldn't come to common ground, they went their separate ways. Now, I ask myself, how could a God-ordained relationship 
call it quits so easily? How could something that God put together to further his gospel and further these two men's purpose be destroyed over something like this? I believe that this is just my opinion. Paul was the issue in this relationship. Paul had some problematic, problematic qualities that just made him difficult at times to deal with. Barnabas was, was looking to forgive John Mark. Look past that first go around and, hey, let's give him another shot. Yet Paul was seemingly so unwilling to, to forgive and move forward. He was unwilling to see past this one issue and carry on furthering the gospel as he was doing so with Barnabas. Jesus' fundamental message, the message he preaches with, with about time after time, is forgiveness. Giving people a second chance and not holding on to what they were doing before and giving them the opportunity to be made new. When we keep people in this box and what we perceive them to be, we're only doing ourselves a disservice. Because we're shielding ourselves from potentially building a God-ordained relationship with said person. Remember, God will never force anything onto us. He gives us choice. And it's our choice whether we forgive and move forward or we stand our ground and won't get out of our own way. How could Paul, a primary figure of Christianity, in its teachings not practice its primary principle? I'm sure some of us are also removing Paul's name from there and putting someone else's name that we could think of in there. How could Paul be so unforgiving? How can we represent Jesus and yet don't know how to let things go. I'm sure we all know how difficult it can be to be in a friendship or relationship with someone who doesn't know how to forgive. We could potentially look at this situation and see something even deeper. The fact that Paul is of the belief that he is so anointed, so saved, so close to, to Jesus that he can treat people who he perceives as lesser any way he sees fit. He potentially believes he's so close to God, he's not obligated to treat John the right way. There are people in, in, in churches who think they are so righteous they can be rude to others. There are people who think they're so holy they could be nasty to others. There are people who think they know so much about the Bible that they can't even greet each other with a smile. Something is severely wrong when you claim to be close to God, but you can't be close to your brother or sister in Christ. Sometimes we confuse holiness with ugliness, and God has never called us to be rude or dismissive. The fruits of the Spirit do not mention anything about having a difficult personality. That is not a gift that comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit calls us to be kind, compassionate, loving, patient, merciful. There's something wrong with your Holy Spirit if you believe that the Holy Spirit gives you the right to be malicious or spiteful to God's children. Matthew 10, 16 says that we must be wise as a serpent but harmless as a dove. Matthew 5, 9 says, blessed are the peacekeepers for they shall be known as the children of God. John 13, 35 says, by this, by this shall people know you are my disciples when you have love towards one another. You will always have difficulty with someone in a relationship who believes they're too close to God in order to treat you the right way. Now, another issue that Paul uh, has is re read his head twice in scripture. Two instances where we see Paul is angry with Barnabas. One, where we read in Acts 15, when Barnabas is trying to bring John Mark along for the second trip, while Paul refuses. Paul has an issue with John Mark that Barnabas just doesn't share. The second instance takes place in Galatians 2. What happens is Paul is in Galatia and Peter shows up instruct, and instructs that the Jews and Gentiles must eat separate from one another. Paul is upset that Peter would make this statement, and even more so that Barnabas basically agrees with the assessment. Paul is angry with Barnabas because he doesn't take Paul's side. In Acts 15, the issue is that Barnabas is willing to forgive and move forward. 
with John Mark and Paul isn't. In Galatians 2, the issue is that Barnabas sides with Peter over Paul. It seems that Paul has a fundamental issue. He can't take that someone who's in his world doesn't agree or side with every point of view he has. Paul needs you to have an issue with who he has an issue with. Dislike who he dislikes. Whatever he believes, he wants you to believe it as well. Paul cannot handle the fact that Barnabas has put Barnabas has pushed back on two separate occasions. He wants everyone in the circle to think like he does. It's as if Paul had an addiction to being right. Paul cannot handle Barnabas challenging his thoughts or perspectives. Having a friendship with someone who feels the need to be right all the time is exhausting. You need people in your circle that'll push back. You need someone who's going to look at your vision and say it's too small, open up your eyes, see the bigger picture. You need someone who's going to bring a different perspective. This is why when you have, you know, a project or a task at work, it's always good to bring a set of cold eyes onto it. They could bring a level of unbiased and untainted outlooks to the situation. If people in your circle are always agreeing with you, well, your circle's too small then. You've shielded yourself from constructive criticism and private reproach. Now, when we look back at Acts 15, we see that Barnabas and Paul, they go their separate ways. But we see that one missionary trip that consisted of Barnabas and Paul together, there's now two. The gospel is now being spread two times as fast because God was able to take a negative situation and flip it into his favor. Paul is able to recognize that even though God is blessing Barnabas so gracefully, he's also blessing Paul with that same grace. We see in 1 Corinthians 9 that Paul makes a turn for the better. He begins to give Barnabas his flowers at this point. Paul, I feel like, began to realize that the favor of God on someone else is never at your expense. The favor of God on someone else is never at your expense. It is not as if God is blessing someone else and when it comes to you, you get the leftovers or the scraps. Everyone's grace and blessings are specifically made and ordained for them. God numbers the hairs on our head and knew us even, bore, even before we were conceived. He knows the good and the bad we've all been through and he maneuvers with a special nature for each and Barnabas and Paul remembered were put together by the Holy Spirit through prayer and fasting. The Holy Spirit ordained the relationship and yet they broke it up in their feelings. That which God has joined together is broken up based on temporary human moments. Let us always consult with God through prayer and fasting and change behavior to his kingdom forward. As we work together as a church family, as God's children, we can always achieve more and more together. Amen. Let's all rise for our closing hymn. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship
Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful service, dear Lord, where we ra raised your name and praised your name, dear Lord. We thank you for all the wonderful members and visitors that came here, allow us to have a good rest of our Sabbath, and we also pray for the fellowship lunch that we're going to enjoy. Thank you for the hands that prepared it, dear Lord. Yes. We're grateful and we're thankful for you, dear Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Guide up, oh. 